Welcome to the Prepped and Polished podcast, the podcast that empowers you to take control of your education, featuring weekly interviews with influencers in the world of education, as well as tutoring tips, lessons, and updates. And now, here's your host, Alexis Avila. And welcome back to the Prepped and Polished podcast. This is episode 214. You can join our Prepped and Polished community by finding us on SoundCloud, Facebook, Instagram. Just type Prepped and Polished and you'll find us. And also go to our website, PreppedandPolished.com, if you have a question or a reaction during or after the podcast. Um, a chat box will appear if you go to our website and uh, just type your question in there. Today I'm speaking with uh, Ron Carruthers who is a, uh, an expert on college planning and college funding. And he's the author of the book, What Your Guidance Counselor Isn't Telling You, Inside Secrets to Choosing Your Career, Selecting Your Major, and Getting In to Your Top Choice College. He has worked with over 4,600 families, helping make children's dreams a reality while providing sound financial guidance along the way. Ron is an adjunct instructor at Palomar and Mira Costa Colleges in San Diego, and he's a regular on San Diego's morning news programs. He's been interviewed on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox, been quoted on Newsweek Magazine, US, USA Today, and Wall Street Journal, among many other publications. On today's episode, Ron gives us his best tips on how to pay for college without going broke. Listen to my other podcast with Brian Lomax. It was our fourth episode. And you can also listen to our other financial aid podcast with Todd Weaver, episode number 210 on FAFSA tips to get the most financial aid. Now let's get right to our podcast. This is episode number 214 with Ron Carruthers. Hey, Ron, thanks for coming on the Prepped and Polished podcast. How are you doing today? I'm well, thanks. Thanks you so much for having me. Uh, can you tell our audience a little of your background, uh, focusing on a few pivotal moments that led you to where you are today uh, as a nationally recognized financial aid expert? <laughs> sure. It came from my own inability to afford college when I was a teenager. Um, I was valedictorian back when they still had those um, out of a college that it was just assumed you would go to, you, I mean, out of a high school that it was assumed you would go to college at. And everything was great. I got into plenty of top schools, except we had no idea how to afford school. And so I just went and worked for a couple of years. And then when I came back to go to be both a certified financial planner and a CPA, I never sat for either exam. I tripped over the college rules, which weren't being taught in either program and realized this was something parents really needed to know. And so I began teaching on this subject 27 years ago, and that's pretty much all I've done since. Tell us a little bit about your business, roncarruthers.com, and what we will find there. Well, hopefully you'll find a ton of good information about different situations and what parents can do. It's predominantly geared towards parents of high school students that really didn't save enough money for college, which is a lot of families. And so we try to walk them through every step of the process on what to do in each situation, what to do if you make a lot of money, what to do if you make a little bit of money, uh, what to do if you have property, don't have property. And then I run a consulting business where people want hands-on help on this. They're free to reach out to me and we'll see if we can help them. Awesome. And do you help families all over the U.S. or is it just uh, California-based? You know what? It started out California-based. Um, but actually even early on, I would get families that had a cousin or a friend or a college roommate across the country. So the majority of my clients are in California, but I, I have them coast to coast, Florida, Massachusetts, you name it. I've got them everywhere. Awesome. Um, let's start with just a couple, uh, general college prep questions. So what are some of those three things, uh, uh, colleges are looking for? Curious. Um, really <laughs> It's kind of the same three things for everybody. If you're looking to get in and you don't have a substantial amount of money to try and bribe your way in, or you really don't want to risk the jail time, here's the three every school is looking for. Number one is good grades. But good grades changes with every school. So the definition of good grades at Stanford is going to be different than it is at a lot of other schools. Okay. So decent grades, number one, everybody kind of knows that. Yeah. Board scores, good SATs and good ACTs at each of those um, 
for what's good for each of those schools. Again, it varies school to school. But here is a tip that's absolutely a writer downer, which is the SATs and ACT scores are almost 100%, 100% what's considered when schools are giving out merit money. So you, there's one set of scores that'll get you into a college and another set of scores slightly higher that will get families money regardless of their financial situation. So that's something to keep in mind to research for parents. The third thing is where most people are a little unsure, and it's what the Ivy Leagues call a distinguishing excellence. And all it means is, what did you do outside of the classroom that's going to be interesting to the schools you're applying at? So it could be a lot of, it could be extreme volunteer work, it could be sports, it could be a musical instrument, it could be a combination of the above. And really what each school is looking for is a couple of things that a student really has an interest in and has spent time in while keeping good grades and good board scores for that school. That's what schools are looking for. Those three things, that's what it comes down to every single time. Nice. Is it better to go a a cheaper, more affordable to go to a community college first before going into a four-year college? It It depends on the family. So what really, what shocks a lot of people is for most of America, 75% of America, it costs less to send their student to a four-year college right out of the gate than it does to send them to the community college. So nothing wrong with the community colleges at all. But a lot of parents just default, well, I'm going to send my kid there, I'll save a bunch of money. And they don't often save anything or not near as much as they think they would because if parents take the time to understand the formulas and how aid's being given, a lot of them are eligible for stuff that they don't realize. Just like my family would have been, we just didn't know. Nobody told us. So not necessarily. Wow, that's interesting. So student debt is a problem. Um, what, can, what can parents do now to avoid this for, for their kids? learn the formula. So here's what that means. Congress 40 years ago created a formula. They've tweaked it a few times since that determines what they feel based on 101 criteria, literal 101 criteria, what a parent can afford for one year for their student to go to any school in America. So the first thing that parents, your listeners need to realize is that formula doesn't make sense to a sane person. Okay. Um, the definition of an asset, for instance, is very specific. So Alexis, what you or I would put down if we're going to the bank as our assets is completely different than what would get listed on this form. And so, and most of what you and I would list applying for a bank loan wouldn't count on this form. And so if parents will take the time to understand what the instructions on the formula actually are when they're filling out their financial aid paperwork, they would be shocked to find that the number is probably a lot lower. And then if you get into a little bit of strategic planning to to legitimately bring it even lower, now that number gets sent to every college that you're looking at. And then they determine the difference between the, their cost, your number, and how much of that they're going to give you. And so, you, could, you number one, want to make sure your number's legitimately as low as possible. Number two, pick schools that have money to give you versus schools that don't. And all of a sudden, we help parents all the time who routinely thought they were going to go deep into student debt. And have to refinance homes and maybe stop contributing to retirement. And all of a sudden they find college is actually pretty affordable. And um, that's the thing that most families don't realize. I've seen a couple families recently, like really bright students get into like, maybe like an Ivy league, but then they end up going to like, to like a UMass Boston full ride honors program. Have you seen that yourself? Just to save, save money. 
I have seen that out here on the other coast in yeah. California where kids will get into Ivy League and then turn around and go to, say, Berkeley because Berkeley offered them a full ride. Yeah. Here's what's crazy. The majority of my students, though, go to the Ivy Leagues wow. if they can get in, which is always the trick, for the same or less money as they would go to a local city college. I mean, not a city college, but a state college. My own daughter, University of Southern California, USC, was cheaper for her, not by much, but it was a little bit cheaper for her than UCLA. And no one, none of our friends believed it. You own a home, you have a business, and yet understanding the system makes that different. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And you have another uh, a child at Northeastern. He just graduated. Not, not, so a, not a cheap stayed... school. <laughs> <laughs> no, he had a great experience, by the way. That co-op program they have there is awesome. Yeah. But, um, yeah, he graduated. And he, uh, why? He loves Boston. He says he's staying in Boston. So, um, yeah, look for a really tall kid, about six foot seven, wandering around. That's my son. Hey, that's awesome, man. If he needs a, uh, if he wants a tutor, prepped and polished. Looking for, looking for all right. <laughs> He's, he might be getting ready to go back to grad school pretty soon, so yeah, we'll definitely keep that in mind. Okay. Um, what about uh, affording college? Um, what do parents need to know uh, if they didn't save enough? I would go back to Alexis. The formula is really important to understand. Okay. So my experience practicing at this, and I actually teach at a couple um, community colleges classes on how to afford four-year colleges nice um i've been to a ton of high school financial aid nights and generally what they do is they show you the form here's the form put your name here on the form put your address here on the form put your income here on the form what they don't talk about is understanding the formula behind the form understanding the questions they have to research about each school their student might be applying to, how much of my need will you meet based on the formula, how much of it is free money, grant money, scholarship money that won't get paid back, and how much will you, um, how many years is it going to take my student to graduate college? And every school has a slightly different answer to that. So if they start there and they might go in thinking they're going to be paying 35000 a year for a UMass or, you know, 70000 a year for a Northeastern, when they realize, hey, the real number comes down to fifteen or 20000 then they can begin to work on that number and really saving that even if there's only a little bit of time left. So that's where we focus. And then they don't have to go deep into student debt the way some families are. Awesome. Uh, you say that uh, there's you, you had a number, 85% of families make this one mistake, cost them a lot of free money. Uh, yep. What is that one you Ready mistake? for it? Ready. Not, under, not understanding their assets. Wow. When I do FAFSA reviews and FAFSA edits, which I'll do for anybody that wants me to take a look at it, um, and we don't charge for it, um, we'll go through and generally in the time between I walk from the printer back to my desk to get to my phone, which is about 20 steps, mm -hmm. I can find that 85% of the time they've listed assets incorrectly. That's such a killer. And even when the government went and gave um, the IRS access to talk so you could download your information directly from the IRS, of the 156 lines that you fill out on a FAFSA, it only transfers 12 of them. So you wow. still have 144 lines that you have to hand fill out and assets, assets, assets are the ones that everybody seems to screw up. Wow. So that's the mistake. That's your tip for everybody. Go check that. If you're in school and listening to this, go back and check that. The odds are eight in 10 that you made a mistake there. What about your five step process to getting the most free money? So here's, what, here's the way it goes. Number one is that any parent can follow this that'll just put the time in. So step number one is you want to make sure you understand the formula, get your share as low as possible. That's always step number one. And again, there's nothing immoral or weird about it any more than 
putting money in an IRA isn't cheating the tax system. Mm -hmm. So that's the very first thing is understand that number. Okay. Number two is pick schools that either are affordable on their own or have money to give you. And again, surprisingly, a lot of the Ivy League, a lot of the more expensive schools, if you go about it the right way, have money to offset that. Number three is Fill out your forms accurately and on time. Keyword accurately, keyword on time. Now, quick comment on this. Mm -hmm. um, a couple years ago, the Obama administration tweaked when you could fill out your forms. And so they made it so instead of January 1 of the year your kid would go to college, you could do it October 1 the year before. Somehow that got translated into everybody's minds that, you had to fill it out on October 1 or you're going to lose out on all the money. That's absolutely not true. Um, most students haven't even applied to college by October 1, so the school doesn't need your financial aid paperwork. They wouldn't know what to do with it. But it does mean you pay attention to their deadlines and make sure to get it in earlier. A general rule of thumb is December is fine. And you don't want to apply the first two weeks of October because the system goes live every year without a real amount of stress testing. So it always breaks down the first two weeks of the year. It's been happening 27 years that I've been doing this. I'm sure it happened before that. So by December and you're fine. Um, the fourth thing is to explain away any discrepancies. So because they're looking at information that's now two years old, when determining your financial aid, things change. You could have lost a job. You could have been married, but now you're divorced. You could have been single, but now you're remarried. You could have gotten a one-time bonus. You could have had high medical bills. So you can appeal a financial aid decision. At, and most of the time that we appeal, and occasionally we'll tell our clients, like, look, this isn't appropriate. Let's just be happy with what we have. Mm -hmm. But most of the time that we appeal, we get more money. And more money means more free money, not more loans. So you can appeal a decision in the college. That's step number four. And step number five, then and only then do you have your students start looking for grants, I mean, outside scholarships. But you've got to get the other things dialed in first because those are generally worth tens of thousands of dollars in many cases where scholarships are a few hundred to a thousand or so for the majority of them. So take care of the big money first, then worry about the other money. And then just without getting into the numbers and hearing just your, your tips are invaluable, I would assume that, if, okay, so obviously like families are very like skeptical about hiring somebody to, to help them through this process because it costs money. But I'm assuming that they, they get it back and then some. Do you find that? At least, at least as far as anybody I work with, we consult with them and sit down, chat over what they're looking to have happen, tell us what they've saved, tell us what their income looks like, their financial picture. And usually in 45 minutes, I can give them a really good idea if I can help them. So I cannot speak to everybody, but I can tell you in our office, we can take a look at everything. And, and based on the schools you're looking at and what you're doing, yes, it's worth it to help hire us. Or you know what, you've got this. Just make a couple tweaks here. And so the idea that I really, I'm an accountant by training. Um, so my feeling is everything should be an investment. If you're giving us money, nice. you should get a return on investment of a multiple. Then it makes sense. And the majority of my practice is referral based. Nice. So, awesome. you know, taking good care of families is just smart business. And where I live in Southern California is like the worst kept secret. Everybody knows where my house is at <laughs> and what car I drive. So, <laughs> so it makes sense from that standpoint also. The Boston, Massachusetts people have a little harder time coming and getting me. But, um, yeah, they can find me super easy. That's funny. Um, uh, let's just talk briefly about 529. So you say that most 529 plans hurt families more than help. Um, how is that possible? Oh, man, how long do we have? Now you're going to get me all worked up. Yeah. Uh, so I just started thing, at 529, all, so hopefully it's not too bad. <laughs> so here, here's the thing that they don't tell you with 529. Okay. I'll tell you a funny story on this. 
I have exactly one groupie. So, and he's a, he's an old white guy. So definitely, you know, like not the thing, but he follows me around and he goes to all my workshops and he stopped a couple of years ago because he was in his seventies. So I hope he's okay. Actually, now I'm thinking about it. I got to go check on him. <laughs> but he went to college with Lawrence Sumner and Lawrence Sumner was Bill Clinton's um, secretary of the treasury. And then he went on to be Dean of Harvard. So when 529s first came into vogue, like really began to be pushed and, and prominent, my groupie, Frank, calls his college buddy, Lawrence, and is like, hey, what do you think of these? Here was the dean of Harvard's response. Are we on or off the record? Now that right there should tell you something. Yeah. And he Absolutely. goes, man, we're buddies. We're off the record. And he goes, they're the greatest Thing Harvard has ever seen or any college because they're, and this is the important part to understand, they were designed to be an estate planning tool for grandparents, not a college savings tool for parents. So every year I write on May 29th, 529 day, which hilariously happens to be my, my wedding anniversary. <laughs> I didn't plan that. Um, just one year I woke up, I'm like, oh, we got married on 529, didn't we? Um, <laughs> I write an article and anybody email me, I'll send them the article. It is six reasons that Ron hates 529. And the biggest one is at most colleges, they count against you more than normal money would. And if you just stop and think about it, it makes sense. You've told the college this money's for college. We're going to give it to you and we will be penalized if we don't use it for college. And the school, if you're otherwise eligible for aid, which way more people are than realize they are, now you've got this special bucket of money that the school's going to treat differently and penalize you. So if you're a good boy and you save your money in a 529 for college, and I spend mine on whiskey and fast cars and gambling trips to Vegas, the school's going to penalize you if everything else is equal and reward me for being bad with my money. That's my biggest default. The other piece of this gets into financial planning principles. And again, I wrote an article every year with six, six reasons I don't like them. The fees are a little bit higher than the normal mutual fund. They count mm -hmm. against you. But here's the other tricky part of these. If you have money in a 529 and the market drops like it did in 2000, like it did in 2008, in 2008, the market lost 50% of its value-ish within just a matter of months. And here's the crazy part. It took five years for the market to get back to break even. So if you've got a kid that you're getting ready to send off to college and right before your kid goes to college, the market tanks and you lose half your value. And I know people will say, well, I'd be more conservative than that. Hold on. We're going to get to that. But if it loses half their value, what do you tell your kid? Hey man, just stay at home, go get a job. I'll let you know when you can go to college. Mm, not yet. Got to wait another year. Oh, you got to wait five years. Your kid's 23 because that's how long it took to get back to where it was. That's one of the biggest concerns. With retirement money, you're pulling that money over a much longer period of time. Mm, gotcha. And so it's a different deal. With college, you're pulling it in a very short window, so there isn't the time to recover. But the other, and then what people tell me is, oh, well, I wouldn't be foolish like that. I'm just gonna make my money real conservative. And I'm like, great. But if you're too conservative, the only point to the 529 is that when the money grows, you get to pull it out tax free if you're using it for college. If it doesn't grow, there's no tax savings. So we defeated the purpose in the first place. And right. then you have those other negative factors. So, you know, look, you shouldn't take advice from doctors on the internet, right? <laughs> or TV doctors. Yes. You absolutely should not take advice on a podcast for your specific situation <laughs> when it regards 529 money. So please don't do anything based on what I just said. But 
if you're otherwise eligible for aid, you might want to research this. And if any of your audience wants to chat with me about financial aid, you already gave them the website. Just shoot us an email. They can, we can look at FOSS's form. We can look at the 529s. We can do whatever they want. We'll tell them, yeah, leave it where it's at. Just take the hit or mm, we got to move this. And do you have like two minutes for a quick story on this? Please. So we had a guy. He's up in the Bay Area. Um, he's a big manager for FedEx makes good money, has rental property. His wife passed away. He, um, from cancer, he met his second wife at like a survivor's group for parents without partners or something like that. Her husband had passed away. She had property. So this is the prototypical six figure Bay area family. No, never, all their friends told them, you're not going to get any financial aid. Hmm. And, um, so we sat down and working with them and we're like, look, if your kid wants to go, I can get your expected family contribution, that number that the schools are going to give you, I can get that down to $45,000 a year from like <laughs> 120. Now, if his kid wanted to get a Berkeley or San Francisco State, there's no point in doing or tweaking anything because the $45,000 that they're going to expect them to pay is more than both those schools. But here's the thing. His kid wanted to go to Northeastern school number one, hmm. George Washington school number two. Those schools a few years ago were 65000 hmm. So I'm like, look, man, we can get you down to 45000 That means you are eligible for 20 some odd thousand dollars of aid at each of these schools, and you'll probably get about half of it hmm. if we move if we move your $80,000 529, because what the schools are going to do is, even if I get your EFC, that number down to 45,000, they're going to look at the 80,000, divide it by four and go, well, on top of the 45,000, you can afford 20 more thousand dollars a year in this 529. And so we went and I told him, look, you got a decision to make. I cannot guarantee you anything, but if those are your top two schools, I've been at this a long time. My gut tells me you will get eight to $10,000 free money each year at one of them, which is way more than the tax savings and way more than the few thousand dollars of tax and penalty you're going to pay if we move it. And the markets, it's all invested in the stock market. This was, again, like three years ago. The market's been going up for seven years. If it loses even 10% of its value, that's a bigger loss than the taxes we'll pay now by, by moving this money and getting it somewhere exempt. So he's, I'm like, you got to make the decision. I feel pretty good about it, but it, it, it's yours. And, and again, I'm, I can't guarantee you anything, but I, but I feel good. And my experience tells me we're in good shape here. He's like, all right, let's do it. Let's get it. Let's see what happens. Northeastern would not budge. They gave him zero dollars. We asked everybody we could think of, the director of financial aid, the head of the department, everybody. Nope, 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 nothing. But George Washington hmm. gave him $17,500 free money a year. Wow. Each and every year. If you add that That's up, awesome. by moving the money, he basically got almost an equivalent amount that I guarantee you he would not have gotten had he left it alone. So again, your mileage may vary, but for a guy that made six figures, that had property, that everybody told you're never going to get anything, he got a free year just by being a little bit smart about how he went about that. So, so that's an example of where a 529 rescue paid off. And you know what? He didn't care about the $4,000 in taxes he had to pay at that point. Didn't matter. He came out ahead. Wow. That's awesome. Um, okay. So what about for families who don't get enough financial aid? What's, what are their options? So okay, there's, two, there's really two. Okay. One is they can turn around and absolutely appeal to the college. An appeal means getting an actual financial aid officer on the phone, not a student or a graduate student that happens to be answering the phone for that department. 
mm-hmm. but a real financial aid officer on the phone explaining the situation and seeing what other aid they have, if anything. Mm-hmm. Again, you'd be surprised at how much of the time they're like, you know what, we have this scholarship, no problem, we'll flip this your way. And a perfect example is a single mom out of Oregon just called me like last minute. Her kid was absolutely going to Hofstra no matter what. And she's just like, man, they left me a little light. We didn't really have any change in circumstances. She didn't lose her job. She didn't have medical bills. We're like, you know, just explain to them. You're an educator. You're a single mom. Is there anything else you can do for me? They gave her an extra $2,000 of free money off a 250 word email and a phone call. Yeah. So like, not life changing, but times four, that's 8,000 because we'll give it to her for each of the years. So absolutely appeal. That's number one. If you're still like way, way, way short, then you have two options there. One is now maybe you do go the community college route. If they're just not willing to budge, try again in two years or we get a list. I, a semi-secret list mm-hmm. that most people don't know is available of schools every year, about four to 500 colleges. That's one fifth of the four year colleges in America, by the way, mm-hmm. that still have space available after the deadline. And by the way, most of them have housing and financial aid and they'll tell us right on that list. So, The thing that gets everybody in trouble with college is people get really, really irrational about it, Mm -hmm. you know, in a way that they wouldn't necessarily about a lot of other things that big of a purchase in their life. Right. I want to drive a Ferrari. Ferraris are awesome. (laughs) I don't, though, because I don't want to tie up all my money in a Ferrari. (laughs) Uh, Maybe someday. Who knows? But not today. And it's the same thing with parents that, you know, send their kids to a $70,000 a year school that they're not getting enough help at, or even a thirty-five or a $40,000 a year school that they're just not getting enough help at. Let's be practical on this a little bit. And so, again, the list of schools that I get every year with space available has some really good schools on it. They're just not, um, you know, they just, for whatever reason, didn't completely fill up. Wow. And how do we best get in touch with you and work with you? You know what? If anybody wants to reach out, they can go to my website, which is roncrothers.com. I believe there's a contact button on there where they can call um, 760-607-7021, 760-607-7021. Tell me that you heard me on the Prepped and Polished podcast. And um, we'll set up a time to chat about your situation and whatever's on your mind. And um, like I said, we'll do FOSTA reviews. We can chat about your 529s. And I will be the bluntest person in the world if I feel (laughs) I can save you a bunch of money. I will absolutely tell you. If I can't, I'll be like, nah, man, you're doing great. Do this, do this. Tell your friends I'm awesome. Call Alexis. Tell them it was a good meeting. And, uh, you know, just keep spread the word. College. I mean, to get philosophical, college debt is a huge problem. Yeah. It will be a huge issue for the next election cycle, probably the one after that. Mm. And the fact is, for so many people, college may not be free. But college is way more affordable if you understand the system than, than you would be led to believe by friends, family, and even the schools themselves. So definitely this is an area where you, it pays to get educated and even a little bit of education will save you tons and tons of money. So don't leave this and think it's for the others. I can't tell you how many people come to me after my workshop where their spouse drug them kicking and screaming and you can see it, right? They're grumpy. They don't want to be there. And at the end, they come up and they're like, thank you so much. This was awesome information. Like, I really appreciate this. And they go on to save big money because they took the time to understand. So I really appreciate you having me on. Every little bit to get the word out helps. Yeah, this is great, Ron. Thanks for coming, uh, coming on the podcast. Appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Anytime you want to have me on, I will be there. So um, thanks, Alexis. I really appreciate it. 
And this wraps up our show today. This was episode number 214 with Ron Carruthers. To connect with Ron and to work with him, check out his website. It's roncarruthers.com. I'm going to spell that for you. R-O-N-C-A-R-U-T-H-E-R-S.com. Hope you enjoyed today's episode number 214. And for another related episode, listen to my podcast with Todd Weaver on FAFSA tips. Uh, tune in soon to hear our next podcast episode number 215 it'll be our next tutoring tips episode and to access all of our episodes go to prepdandpolish.com forward slash podcast thank you for joining us on the Prepped and Polish podcast now go out there and take control of your education you've been listening to the Prepped and Polish podcast for more information check out preppedandpolish.com also you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter thanks for listening class dismissed <laughs>